Okay. Well, the uh, clock is just uh, ticked to one o'clock Barcelona time, so I think we're ready to get started. And so uh, to kick off, I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to take a quick look in the room and see uh, the uh, participants that we have here. Great. I can see we've got a pretty good uh, crowd. I can see some familiar faces. It's been a while since I've uh, done a presentation for FX Street and uh, excited to be back. Boyki, great to see you. Great. Well, I assume everyone can, can hear and see me okay. In that case, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Today we're going to be talking about money management and trading, uh, which is a very important topic in a long time under discussed, a lot of people think about like, setup rules and technical trade entries and that kind of thing and, and neglect. Um, thank you for that feedback, Boyke. You're saying it's soft as well. Um, speak a little louder. So, um, as I was saying, money management is something that's kind of been underrepresented and a very important um, subject when it comes to, uh, to trading successfully. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Just want to talk uh, about myself and uh, getting started here. Let you let you know a little bit about my background. I started my career in trading as a clerk at the CME, uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in Chicago. I started off as a runner in the currency futures uh, part of the exchange back when they still had a Deutschmark, uh, and uh, got started there. I stayed in Chicago and traded a couple of different uh, prop trading firms. Over in Chicago, and um, that was actually off the floor. I never traded on the floor. Uh, I'm getting a, a note that the sound's not stable. Is that any better? It's fading. Let me play with the settings just for a second, just to make sure we can get a strong sound. Stay in front of the mic. Okay. So I started out uh, as a clerk at the CME, traded a couple of different uh, prop trading firms in Chicago. <clears throat> I was trading off the floor. I was trading bond futures on the front. Um, first, I was trading uh, Europe, the uh, bond futures, the Bullen, the Bob, and the Shatsi. And later on, I was trading uh, U.S. 10 uh, futures. Um, I also did a stint as the uh, futures and forex broker, so I uh, got some bond that side of the industry now. Uh, gave me some insights into uh, you know how people trade and the mistakes that uh, retail traders make, and um, also uh, just sort of general insights into how the, uh, the industry works. So I'll just try and I'll try and speak loud. And if if anyone's having trouble hearing me, please keep uh, you know keep letting me know <clears throat> letting me know about it. So, uh, yeah, experience as a futures and forex broker, series three, uh, license, and, uh, like I said, that gave me some insights in how retail traders, uh, mistakes they make and so forth. Uh, later on, I founded a website called traderslog.com, which I've been working on for a number of years, and, um, working in conjunction with, uh, FX Street here in Barcelona, I used to do a, a regular webinar for him, so I'm familiar with, uh, some of the, uh, some of the people in the crowd, including, uh, Boyd, you can see here. Um, what I'm interested in now is uh, I'm interested in developing uh, these websites I'm working on, including Traders Log. I'm also still interested in, in trading actively, and, and what I do is, uh, in my style, uh, analysis, what I like the best is to look for is to look for clear-cut uh, price action setups. Uh, um, you could call them, you know, technical setups um, on a swing trading time frame. I like to focus on, on the currency markets, mostly the major currencies, and um, we can cover that in a bit more detail. Um, a bit about my personal life, I'm currently living in Barcelona. Love it here. It's a wonderful city uh, and wonderful people. So moving on, let's jump in to the, uh, the meat of the presentation and um, just go over what we're going to cover today. First of all, we're going to cover why it's important to have uh, a money management strategy at all. 
We're going to look at some basic uh, money management concepts. We're going to look at some more sophisticated concepts um, among the leading position sizing and asset allocation formulas, uh, including optimal F. Um, and then we're going to take a look at a mechanical trading system and um, the position tri- sizing strategy in that in that system. And we're going to look at one system in particular, which is the turtle trading system, which you may have heard of. Okay, before we get into the next uh, slide, could the moderator um, use the uh, the poll that we have? I think that will be a good time to uh, to answer this poll that we had predefined. And the question was, do you have a daily profit target and loss limit? Uh, levels predefined before you get to get into your trading day. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is um, relates to the question of why it's important to have a, uh, a money management strategy. Um, and I think this is uh, a powerful example and an illustration of, of why it is. Uh, oh, great. Here we have the result. And we have um, 19 out of 43 saying yes and 15 out of 43 saying no. So I'm glad to see that uh, a majority of people do have Redefined um, daily profit and loss limit. Okay, so going back to this uh, this slide here, we're talking about behavioral economics and trading. This I think is a powerful illustration of why it's important to have a money management strategy. So, behavioral economists have shown that people inherently make irrational decisions when it comes to investing. Uh, there's a famous study, a classic study by Kahneman and Bursky where subjects were given a choice between a certain $3,000 gain versus an 80% chance of a $4,000 gain and a 20% chance of getting nothing. The large majority of people chose the $3,000 gain, and I think I would have been in my hand. I would have wanted to take that certain $3,000, and probably the majority of you will say the same thing. Then they flipped it over, and the question was reversed. And the subjects were given the choice between a certain loss of $3,000 versus an 80% chance of losing $4,000 and a 20% chance of losing nothing. And in this case, the majority of people chose to take the 80% risk of losing $4,000. So instead of taking a certain loss of 3,000, we would rather take the 8% risk of losing 4,000. And what the study showed was that in both cases, people make irrational choices from a mathematical perspective when calculating an expected win or loss. So how does this, how does this, uh, how does this relate to money management and trading? Jack Schwager, who's the author of Market Wizard, one of the most Famous books on trading. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Um, I think he sums it up very clearly in thinking of his book, Market Sense and Nonsense. An excellent book I highly recommend if you haven't read it. And he says, the experiment re- reflects a quirk in human behavior in regards to risk and gain. And this really sums it up. People are risk averse when it comes to gains, but are risk takers when it comes to avoiding a loss. This behavioral quirk, quirk relates very much to trading and explains why people tend to let their losses run and cut their losses short, which of course is the opposite of what people should do, which is to let their profits run and cut their uh, losses short. Um, so I think that's something very important to bear in mind when you're thinking about why it's important to to take money management seriously in the trading, because it's almost like we're, we're hardwired. Human nature is, is uh, driving us to do the wrong thing. Our natural instinct is to actually do the opposite of what we should be doing. And that, uh, probably explains why so many, uh, so many retail traders in the model and get the often quoted, you know, uh, fact that the majority of retail traders lose money. I 
think it relates very much to, to this study. So moving on, let's look at some basic concepts um, relating to money management. You may have heard of some of these. One very widely held concept um, is known as the 2% rule, um, widely held concept in money management. The 2% rule states that you should never lose more than 2% of your equity on a single trade. Uh, market wizard Larry Hunt from uh, Jack Schwager's earlier book um, said, never risk more than 1% of total equity on any trade. By only risking 1%, I'm indifferent to any individual trade. So by not uh, risking too much on any trade, it takes a lot of the emotion out of the trade, and you can't get into too much trouble on any one single trade. Another thing to bear in mind is you, you might have a very good trading system, but you might happen to enter it at a time when it's going to go down. So you might have a number of bad trades in a row within a good trading system. And if you, uh, if you only risk a low percentage of your capital, you know, when you're going through that drawdown period, it enables you to survive and, and, um, capitalize from a, from a good trade. This is something that you see a lot. If anyone has any questions during the presentation, feel free to, uh, to answer them in the box too, or any comments or questions. A similar concept um, is the six percent rule, which is uh, introduced by Alexander Elder in Come from Trading in his book, stating that if the value of your account falls six percent below its closing value the prior month, you should stop trading for the rest of the month. And uh, this this kind of relates to an anecdote that um, the uh, risk manager at one of the trading firms I worked with. That I used to talk about, he used to, to, uh, work for, for a fund run by Monroe Trout, one of the top funds in the world. And he said, what, what happened when they had a big loss, something went wrong, they just shut everything down for the day. They shut everything down and they didn't stop to try and figure out what went wrong, why it went wrong. The first thing they did was shut everything down and then they tried to figure out what went wrong. I think that's kind of an important concept. If there's a big law, you just walk, you know, you just shut things down and then try and figure out. So another important um, concept, I think, in, in when you're looking at money management is uh, the issue of recovering lost equity. When you lose money in trading, the percentage of your return on your remaining capital needs to be surprisingly high to recover that lost equity. And we can look at some percentages now to illustrate that. Consider the following percentages required to recover from percentage losses in your account. A 25% equity loss requires a 33% return to recover from to recover former equity value. A 50% loss, you've got to make a 100% return to recover former equity value. A 75% equity loss requires a 400% return to recover former equity value. And if you go even higher, it's a 90% equity loss requires a 1,000% return to recover former equity value. So when you figure that most money managers struggle to make 10% a year, that's considered very high. You see these small percentages in there. They're staggeringly high. So something to keep in mind when you're, when you're taking losses in your account and sizing up your positions and considering how much to risk. Um, on each position. Next, we're going to talk about stop loss strategies, um, which is another widely used and, and popular way of managing risk in trading, of course, 
And at this point, if we could get the second poll in, please, we can uh, we can look at the stop loss habits of uh, some of the audience and, and, and whether you whether you're using stops. Just give it a, a minute or two for everyone to uh, answer their uh, their answer to that question. the results of the poll. Okay, great. Okay, so the poll is showing that 31 out of 55 people do use stops. 8 out of 55 don't, and 16 didn't answer. Okay, so I'm glad to see that the majority of people do use stops. I think the conventional wisdom um, among traders is that it's a good idea to use stops, although there are successful traders that, that don't. Um, I was reviewing the, the turtle trade system while I was making this presentation. It was uh, an amusing uh, quote in there uh, related to using stops. Um, he quoted, there, there are old traders and there are bold traders, but there are no old, old bold traders. And, um, and then he says something like, successful you traders use stops, period. You know, it's, it's, it's what you should be doing. In, in trading, uh, um, I think it was uh, written by Curtis Bateman, one of the former turtles. I'm not 100 percent sure who it was written by, um, but uh, um, in 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 the in the turtle trading rules, it's very much talks about mechanical trading systems with sets of predefined rules and um, risk management strategies, such as using stops. So yeah, if you're not using stops. I'm that are using it to limit your losses. So let's take a look at the, the different ways um, you can approach the use of stop loss or you can call it a, a money management strategy. Uh, you can use an equity stop where you use a fixed percentage of your equity on a trade and use this to determine the placement of your stop loss order. You can use a chart stop where you use technical analysis, such as support and resistance levels to, to uh, determine where to put your stop. So, for example, you might be uh, long crude oil, and um, but put your uh, sell stop beneath you at a level like the 200 period moving average or you know, 38% retracement, something like that. Also, keep in mind there's two main types of uh, stop loss orders. Um, one being the fixed stop and the other being the trailing stop. Uh, fixed stop is set at a certain price where trailing stop can be set at a fine percentage away from securities current market price, which allows the trader to lock in profit price, price moves their way. So trailing stops are, are, are a nice money tool in that they allow you to, uh, to lock in your profits if you have a good trade. And they also allow flexibility because you can walk away from the market and know, know that the stock's going to trail price and, and lock in that profit for you. So that's an excellent tool for uh, money management. Next, we're going to take a look at some uh, money management systems and, um, and formulas for managing uh, position size. And first of all, I want to touch on the Martingale system. 
One gale is that a well-known system where the size of your investment continually increases after all. So the, the principle behind the system is that statistically you cannot lose all the time. You have to increase the amount allocated in investments in, in anticipation of future, future increase. So by continually increasing the position size, the theory holds that the trade will eventually come off profitable. However, this assumes an unlimited supply of capital. So at a glance, anyone looking at this who's spent some time trading, you'd think that that's a recipe for disaster. It's basically doing what you're not supposed to do, which is doubling down on losers, doubling down on losing trades. Um, and I think it is, uh, personally, I think it's, uh, if you have unlimited capital, sooner or later, it's going to result in a blow up. I was surprised to find that that one of the popular uh, traders running a chat room quite successfully for a long time was was using a Martingale system, and I was surprised that he he lasted so long using it, but he didn't end up having a blow up where he he ended up losing a large amount of capital. So it's a very very dangerous system, and unless you have unlimited capital, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't recommend trading the Martingale system. There's also an anti-Martingale system, which is the inverse, where more risk is taken after profits and risk is tapered after losses. And I think this this is the, the style of money management that we were um, uh, advised to use while I was a trading firm and where um, I think this this is a more advisable system. Ah, I've got someone. I've got a comment here. Yeah, someone said uh, he lost lots of money with Martin Gale when he started out with binary options. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I wanted to bring this up because I think the anti Martin Gale system it relates to what what successful traders do. In my experience, what I've seen, the successful traders in the market, they tend to, to lean into it. So they take more risk while they're at, you know, while they're ahead, they're taking more risk. And when they're going through drawdowns, when they're going through losing periods, they, uh, they cut back their position size and reduce their risk. So I think that's an important concept to keep in mind. Next, we're going to talk about uh, some of the more sophisticated money management um, studies and uh, position sizing formulas. Um, one of the best known is the Kelly criterion, which was originally developed by John Kelly while working uh, for AT&T Bell Laboratory. Oh, this is an old, uh, an old concept, and the method was published in 1956. It was first used by the gambling community to made it as an effective money management tool by the investment community. The Kelly criterion is purely mathematical and looks at two major inputs. W, the probability that a given trade or system will be a winner, and R, the win-loss ratio. You get a percentage derived um, from using these in an equation as far as you can see on the screen. Okay, I'm getting a message that we got some, uh, some sound issues. Can you hear me okay now? Can you confirm with the sound, please? The Kelly percentage is used to show your optimal position size. For example, a Kelly percentage of 0.5 suggests that you should take a 5% position in your portfolio. In gambling, the formula dictates the percentage of capital to be bet at each iteration of the game. Kelly's formula was used by Edward of Thor, both in Blackjack and in the stock market. Thor, the author of Be the Dealer, has been probably one of the most consistently profitable managers over time. In May 2000, in May 1998, Thor reported that his personal investment yielded an annualized 20% rate of return averaged over 20.5 years. 
so using the Kelly criterion, Thorpe was able to, to uh, well, as part of his, his uh, additional driving strategy, he was able to put together a, a tremendous track record, one of the top track records in the business. Jack Schwager, when he was asked um, who the most consistent traders that he'd interviewed in his career, he mentioned um, Ed Thorpe uh, as one of the top guys. <clears throat> and you can see that his uh, his money management um, strategies was a big part of his was a big part of the successful track record that he was able to put together. The Kelly criterion assumes that you're using a consistent set of trading rules. The system helps you limit your losses and maximize your gain through efficient diversification. The Kelly Capital Growth Investment Criterion by Leonard Queen provides an in-depth study if you want to uh, get further into this and, and make a serious study of this as part of your trading strategy. Okay, the other, one of the other most famous uh, money management strategies is Ralph Vince's Optimal F. Uh, the Optimal F method aims to show the optimal amount of risk on each trade to maximize profit. The amount of equity to risk on a given trade. The idea is that you determine the ideal amount of capital to allocate per trade based on past performance. If your Optimal F is 7%, then each trade should be 7% of your account. And here you can see the optimal F formula. The optimal F number itself is a mean based on historical trade results. You can learn, learn more about formulas for optimal allocation and leverage in Ralph Vince's book, The Handbook of Portfolio Mathematics. Uh, Ralph Vince analyzed many systems with computer program for Larry Williams, winner of the 1987 World Cup Championship of Future Trade. Okay, finally, we're going to get into the turtle trading system and take a look at the system itself and the rule and uh, also how uh, position sizing was an important part of the system. Uh, the turtle trading system was reminiscent of the movie Trading Places, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, and a real-life experiment was carried out by the world-class commodity traders Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart. Richard Dennis was wildly successful in his uh, future trading career, having traded an initial stake of less than $5,000 into uh, over $100 million. I believe that anyone could be a uh, part of trade profitably, while Eckhart argued that Dennis had unique abilities that contributed to his success. So the uh, the argument was whether great traders are are, are born or, or are they made. And um, Richard Dennis believed that people could be taught to trade profitably. It wasn't an innate uh, ability. So Richard Dennis set up an experiment to prove his idea by recruiting a group of people to teach his rules to and then having them trade in the live account. According to a former turtle trainer, the two classes of turtles personally trained by Dan earned more than $175 million in over five years. So we can see that this was uh, you know, a successful and profitable system, and he was able to teach it to, uh, to his students, pass it on. Now let's take a look at the, the trading system entry rules. Um, and in doing this, we're, we're going to be able to see that it was a very simple system. And it's actually um, had, it was the nuances like the position size that played a big role in, in the profitability of this system. 
Um, turtles were taught very specifically how to implement a simple trend following strategy, buying breakouts of the upside trading angle, and selling short downside breakouts. The turtle trading system was a complete trading system with no subjective elements left to the trader. It was a completely mechanical trading system. Two systems were used, a shorter-term system based on a 20-day breakout and a longer-term system based on a 55-day breakout. So, for example, turtles, turtles entered when price exceeded by a single tick the higher low of the preceding 20 days. So the entry rules were really that simple. They were just breakouts of these, uh, these different time periods. 20 days of the shorter term system and 55 days as the long term system. So those were the entry rules. But within the system, there is also important um, position sizing uh, uh, rules also. Position sizing was an important part of the total trading system. The turtles used used a volatility-based constant percentage risk position sizing algorithm. Now, what does that mean? It's actually quite simple. It simply means that they manage the dollar volatility of a position by adjusting the position size based on the dollar volatility of the market. So they would adjust their position size based on how the volatility of the market was normalized it by using dollar. So positions in highly volatile markets would have an offsetting smaller number of contracts than positions in markets with lower volatility. So in this way, a trend in a low volatility market would still result in a substantial profit because a higher number of contracts would be used. I can see we're still having some sound issues. So again, the position sizing was managed by looking at how volatile the market was, and that was used to uh, to decide how much, how many contracts to use on a given trade. They they used average true range, as we mentioned earlier on, um, as a measure of volatility. Great. Okay, someone's saying the, the sound is coming through. Okay, great. Um, so in a Along with these very straightforward entry rules, buying and selling breakouts based on a, a set number of days, 20 days and 55 days, two different systems, position sizing was an important element uh, where they looked at the volatility market to gauge how many contracts to put on, a, on, a, on an individual trade. So um, with that, I'd like to wrap it up and thank everyone for coming. Feel free to uh, connect with me and keep in touch. Um, you can find me on my website there. Contact me through that. You can also find me on Twitter. Um, another thing I want to mention was that you can find those t- turtle trading rules on the Internet. Just do a search for turtle trading rules. and You should come up with the results. If you have any trouble finding them, I can point you in the right direction. And otherwise, feel free to contact me with, uh, with any questions you have, and, and feel free to, uh, to any, answer any questions in the, in the chat box now. If there were any areas that you wanted to, um, yeah. Yeah, I've got a question from Drew. And he says, have you used this turtle trading system? Yeah, I have tried trading the turtle trading system, and I think it is uh, it's a good it's a good uh, it's a good system to, to test. When Richard Dennis and the Turtles were using the Turtle Trading System, it was a long time ago, back in the 1980s. And at that time, markets trended more consistently than they do now. So that system worked better back when they were trading it. Um, there, there were there were smoother trends in the small markets, and they they did great. They really uh, they really nailed it by using the system. And I don't think it worked as well as it did back then, but I think it's a, the concepts in the system are useful to learn 
and implement in, you know, if you're putting together uh, ideas for a trading system that you're going to make on your own. Um, so I would highly recommend going through the, uh, the total trading system rule. Drew is also asking me, have I tried Optimal App? I haven't used Optimal App, uh, but it's something that I want to learn more about. I think it's it's something that serious money manage, managers use when they're looking at, you know, allocating assets in their portfolio and diver, uh, diversifying their portfolio. And um, I'm not a money manager, um, and I don't have a, a largely diverse uh, portfolio. I'm, I'm I'm in a different style of trading, really, but um, I think it's it's definitely valuable to uh, uh, valuable to learn more about that. Any other questions from people who who you know who may not have uh, heard sessions of the, the webinar due to sound issues? Please feel free to ask questions now. Returns in the market, um, you know that that's not a coincidence, and very few people have been able to achieve that. And so th- I think, you know, that's evidence that that these um, position size and formulas are, are worth a serious study. I mean, I think it depends where you are and, and your, you know, how, how serious trading is to you. If it's your career and if you're managing money for other people professionally, then it's, yeah, it's definitely a right um, exploring that. It's a question from Kanapira. Kane, if we're not going to risk more than 2%, what's the reason having a big account better than having a small account? Well, I think the problem with risking 2% when you have a small account is that you're, you know, you're, you're going to make a, a small amount of money. You're only going to be able to grow your account at a, a slow rate. But I, I think that's the right thing to do still, even if you have a small account. Because what you see in, in retail for a lot is, is people risking 30%, 50% of their account on single trades and, and blowing out their accounts within a matter of days or weeks. And I can give you first-hand, you know, um, testimony to this, having been been on the brokerage and seen how, how quickly people blow out their accounts. And that's actually one of the great things about Forex. Even if you have a really small account, say you have a, a you know a thousand dollar account or something like that, um, you're able to trade micro lots now. So you're able to test out systems and um, not risk very much when you when you when you're trading. So you can trade micro lots and and figure out whether you've got a, a profitable system. And if you have something good. You know, your equity is going to grow and you're going to be able to, uh, to risk more on each trade as your equity grows. Before, yeah, before I leave, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, to, to share an anecdote from, from, uh, a guy called Jeff Quinto who headed up, uh, the trading firm where I traded in Chicago called Altia Trading. He talks a lot about money management and, um, he was also, in addition to being, you know, the founder of the firm, he was also the risk manager. And there's a story that he likes to tell, which is, while we were traders, we all had, uh, like limits for the day. So you might, if you were a new trader, you might have a $5 million limit. If you were one of the better traders, you might have a $10,000 limit or more. But what would happen was, throughout the course of the trading day, some people would be up money, some people would be down money. Some people would hit their loss limits, and what would happen when you hit the loss limit is you were locked out. You couldn't trade in the the day. But what people would do was they would go to Jeff and say, can you give me, can you raise my limit? Can you give me some more food? And, and he would, sometimes he would do this, and, and, and he reflects on, on his experience doing this, uh, one of the answers he likes to tell. So what he found very quickly was that Giving new traders more uh, uh, more capital to, to use after they've gone out, it almost never worked. So if you if uh, a new trader came, they blown out their five hundred dollar limit, he gave him a thousand dollar limit for the day, they would almost always lose the money. Um, but also some of the good traders, some of the experienced profitable traders, have been there for a while. Sometimes they would blow out and they would go and ask for a larger loss limit. 
And as a risk manager, he he look at it and think, oh, you know, this guy who did two favors, maybe I should give him a shot at making his, his uh, you know, getting back to even for the day or even getting profitable. And so he would do this. Sometimes he would raise the loss limit on one, some of the larger traders. And and what he found was that some of the time it worked out. Some of the time the traders would make back huge losses and end up profitable on the day. And then he decided to start tracking. He tracked it over a period of a couple of years. And so, first of all, he knew that it was never a good idea to give the new trader, uh, you know, an extension on the limit. But he was curious about the, the effect of giving the, the experienced trader a larger loss limit. And what he found over the course, when he looked back at the results of the course of a couple of years, a long time span, was that even with the, the better traders, the successful traders, it never made sense to give them a larger loss limit when you calculated overall. Because, you know, sometimes they wouldn't make it back to break even. Sometimes they would have these losses, blowouts, they, they would lose, you know, even, you know, twice what their previous limit was. So I think that tells you a lot about, um, risk management and, and good risk management practices. And this idea that, you know, like going back to the Alexander Elder, uh, rule idea, where the six percent thing, where you, if you lose a certain amount, you just walk away and figure out what went wrong after. Does anyone else have any other questions? And if you want, I can email you this presentation too. I have yeah, the PowerPoint slide. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's very simple. It's just the idea is to to um, to not risk more than two percent of your equity in a single trade. And the uh, the, psycho- the psychology behind it, you know, it allows you to um, it allows you to keep a clear head, as, as Larry Hyde is quoted here. Because if he's only risking one percent of the equity, he's he's kind of indifferent to the results. He can he, he's kind of uh, distanced from it in a way. And like I said, I wanted to emphasize that even good trading systems have long drawdown here. So you might you might have figured out a really good trading system based on I don't know you know volatility breakouts like the turbo system combined with you know some other things. But when you start it. You know, you might go through a drawdown, but if you're if you're only risking a limited amount each time, you're able to survive that drawdown. And that's one of the key things I think that you see among successful traders. And the other thing among successful money managers that you see a lot is really broad um, diversification in their asset allocation. On a single trade, two percent. Well, I would infer that that he 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 doesn't want to risk more than two percent of his account at any one time, whether it's you know on one trade or on if you, in three positions at a time. You have you know two position two percent on your short the euro and two percent of your account your you know your long again something like that. You know all of a sudden you're risking. More than, you know, uh, more than a lot more than 2% of your account. If there was, the sound was cutting out in any one particular slide, I'd be happy to go back and, and cover that again. Someone wasn't able to hear me at a particular slide. I'll type my email in here if anyone wants to. I'm not sure how bad the sound issue is, but, you know, we might be able to do the, Presentation again uh, on another day. Great, boy. You good to see you again. Yeah. Sa- Saif, I'm not sure if I can. If you want the slides, please just email me at the, my Gmail address there. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what the, um, the schedule is. For FX Street, but I think there may be another webinar coming up. So I'd like to, um, in closing, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Do keep in touch. You can reach me through my personal blog, danblyson.com.
all my contact info is in there. Feel free to contact me. Yeah. And, um, you know, look forward to doing more of these. Apologize for the sound, and I think we'll be able to we'll, we'll be able to iron it out and, and get better sound for you next time. Awesome. Thanks for coming, guys, and look forward to uh, to seeing you again in the future.